What is your major malfunction, numbnuts? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the most brutal, hilarious, and or impactful film insults. Sai Anara. <laughs> Number 30. A Mouth Like That, Caddyshack. Rodney Dangerfield brings humor and chaos to every one of his scenes in Caddyshack. Oh, this is your wife. Oh, a lovely lady. Hey, baby, you're all right. You must have been something before electricity. At a dinner party, his character Al Chervik gets right to work, dishing out several unprompted quips to hilarious effect. He even compares one person's mouth to a fish with this insult. The target may be off screen, but Chervik's delivery is so savage it stings. After all, it's hard to sink lower than comparing someone to an aquatic creature. Plus, Dangerfield's comedic timing is absolutely perfect, selling the moment like only he could here. The result is one of his best quotes of the entire film. When the last time I saw a mouth like that, I had a hook in it. Number 29. Stupid Lessons – The Long Kiss Goodnight Walking down the street, Charlie Baltimore is minding her own business before a guy comes for her. Her partner Mitch Hennessy shows up to help and ends up complicating things with another weapon. What the hell are you doing? Saving your life. I would have been here sooner, but I was thinking up that ham on ride line. Charlie takes back control of the situation, while also criticizing Mitch's methods in a funny twist. This all turns into a classic insult about Hennessy's street smarts. Gina Davis sells the line well, while Samuel L. Jackson's reaction turns this into a truly hilarious sequence. You're always this stupid, or did you take lessons? I took lessons! The chemistry between the actors lights up the screen, with Shane Black's script elevating the whole affair. To top it off, Baltimore then dispatches multiple men without missing a beat. Number 28. Dressing Up – Legally Blonde But it's a costume party, you probably wouldn't want to come. I love costume parties. Brimming with confidence, Elle Woods shows up to a college soiree dressed as a bunny. She then comes across her rival Vivian Kensington, aka the person who made her believe this was a costume party. Woods throws back a response that gives Kensington a dose of her own medicine, making the word frigid sing. Nice outfit! <laughs> oh, I like your outfit too, except when I dress up as a frigid bitch, I try not to look so constipated. The fact that she does it while rocking this outfit just proves that she can defend herself no matter the situation. Reese Witherspoon gives the performance of a lifetime in a sequence that reveals her character's wit and integrity. Legally Blonde is remembered as a fun movie, but it also has insults like this that will make you want to grab a pen and paper. Number 27. The Chief's Takedown – The Big Lebowski When Jeffrey Lebowski gets picked up by the Malibu police chief, he's not dealing with an easy-going guy. Indeed, the lawman doesn't like Lebowski at all, and he lets him know it. The tirade comes flying out of the chief's mouth like he's been preparing it all day. I don't like your jerk-off name. I don't like your jerk-off face, I don't like your jerk-off behavior, and I don't like you, jerk-off. Filmmakers Joel and Ethan Coen make this absurd scene sing with funny dialogue, letting the actors lean into the craziness of it all. It's a hilarious moment that's capped off by a comeback and a flying mug. We'll never tire of watching actor Leon Russom let loose on Jeff Bridges' character. This is someone you'd never want to cross. Stay out of Malibu, Lebowski! Ow! Stay out of Malibu, deadbeat! Number 26. Goldilocks vs. Baby Bear – Puss in Boots – The Last Wish Taking aim at classic characters, Puss in Boots – The Last Wish turns the Goldilocks we thought we knew into a completely different person. Case in point, she gets into a verbal sparring match with Baby Bear that turns ugly. You're not even a bear! Zing! <laughs> I'm more of a bear than you are. The villainess then dishes out a long series of insults, criticizing the creature inside and out. It's wildly entertaining stuff, to put it mildly. Florence Pugh's take on the fairy tale icon becomes devilishly fun with each new word. You're a daft, fat, slow thinking, no reading, Lyme disease, flea ridden, dingleberry bear. Oh! You might have expected this animated kids' movie to be tame, but this moment shows there's something for everyone to enjoy. Number 25. Barry Manilow's Wardrobe – The Breakfast Club After the high school students find themselves in detention, they have to endure the wrath of the vice principal Richard Vernon. Well, well, here we are. John Bender, however, does not seem to care about the rules, let alone about the essay he's supposed to write. So he takes this as an opportunity to question authority, and does so in a truly stylish way. Dissing the older man's style, Bender attacks Vernon from multiple angles, cleverly taking the VP down a notch by invoking Barry Manilow. Yeah, 
I got a question. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? Judd Nelson's snarling performance gives this line an added edge, inspiring us all to dress a little more fashionable. Number 24. Benjamin is no one's friend. Wayne's World. The main villain of this 1990s comedy is Rob Lowe's evil producer Benjamin Kane. But in this scene, the jibe is aimed at his sidekick. Garth and his friends confront Russell Finley about his loyalty to Benjamin in a creative way. You're gonna be Benjamin's monkey boy the rest of your life, is that it? Benjamin's my friend. Dana Carvey's character questions Russell's life choices, boldly going after the latter's fake friendship with the producer. There's even a hilarious description involving a never-before-seen ice cream. If Benjamin were an ice cream flavor, he'd be pralines and Garth may be more subdued for much of the film, but he doesn't hold back here, putting his target firmly in his place. We'll never think of dessert the same way again. Number 23. Defeating Humperdinck, The Princess Bride During his fantastical journey, Wesley proves himself a clever hero who can work his way through anything. He notably uses this wit to outsmart and insult Prince Humperdinck in this scene. Questioning the royal's intelligence, Wesley also compares his adversary to a warthog. And I'll use small words that you'll be sure to understand, you warthog-faced buffoon. All of this and some brutal descriptions eventually lead Humperdinck to stand down. Our protagonist defeats his opponent with words like it's nothing, completely demeaning the man into surrendering. The colorful choice dialogue only adds to the moment's appeal, making it impossible to forget even after the credits have rolled. Mixed with Carrie Elwes' amazing acting, this moment inspires us to up our game. Drop your sword. Number 22. Have fun having a baby at your prom. Bridesmaids. Kristen Wiig's Annie is already having a bit of a rough day, so when a teenage girl comes into her jewelry shop looking for a friendship necklace, Annie can't help but chime in that sometimes friendship doesn't last forever. You're, you're weird. I'm not weird, okay? Yes, you are. No, I'm not, and you started it. No, you started it. Did you forget to take your Xanax this morning? The young girl responds by calling her weird, which kicks off an unforgettable insult-ridden back and forth. God, I feel bad for your parents. I feel bad for your face. Okay, well, call me when your boobs come in. You call me when yours come in. What, do you have four boyfriends? Exactly. Yeah, okay. It's hard to choose a favorite line from this hysterical exchange, but when Annie asks about the girl's boyfriends, well, let's just say things get pretty inappropriate from then on. Have fun having a baby at your prom. You look like an old map. You know what? You're not as popular as you think you are. I am very popular. This side-splitting argument may have gotten her fired, but it kept the audience in stitches and gave us some very quotable moments. Number 21, Ramit, In the Loop. If you take away nothing else from this Oscar-nominated political satire, it's that folks in suits aren't exactly paragons of virtue. Why wasn't I told about this? Why the f would I tell you about it? I've told you off twice and yet you're still here. The story follows the fevered activities of British and American political pundits as they navigate a potential Middle East invasion. One such figure, Malcolm Tucker, is the director of communications for the British Prime Minister, and boy does he communicate. The bulk of his dialogue is profanity-laden, even when he's seemingly not that upset. And in one scene, simply discussing departmental responsibilities with his colleague Judy is enough to send him on a flowery tirade. Malcolm, allow me to pop a jaunty little bonnet on your pub you and ram out of the shitter with a lubricated horse Judy is not impressed, though, and almost outshines him with this effortless comeback. Your swearing does not impress me. My, my husband works for Tower Hamlets, and believe me, those kids make you sound like Angela Lansbury. She's married. Number 20. A sad, strange little man. Toy Story. Throughout much of this animated classic, Woody and Buzz Lightyear have a seemingly never-ending rivalry. The two soon become unlikely travel buddies and find themselves in a precarious position. Let's just say they struggle to get along. And you, my friend, are responsible for delaying my rendezvous with Star Command! You are a toy! After the cowboy goes on a rant about the Space Ranger being a toy, the latter fires back with an elegant put-down of his own. Lightyear's cold and calm demeanor makes the line extra funny. You are a sad, strange little man, and you have my pity. Sure, he might be delusional at this point in the story, not realizing he is actually a plaything. But the line is comedy gold. Tim Allen's performance further sells it. 
creating an insult that's still quoted today. Number 19, Cherub Looking, 21 Jump Street. In this film adaptation of the popular 80s TV show, Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum play Schmidt and Jenko, rookie cops who are recruited to infiltrate a high school and sniff out a drug ring. But before they step foot onto the school's campus, they have to get a briefing from their chief of police, who also happens to be played by a delightfully angry Ice Cube. When he tries to warn the undercover cops that getting romantically involved with the students is off-limits, he's obviously targeting Jenko, but Schmidt hilariously misunderstands. Sir, I know we come off as a couple of lady killers, but I promise you we will be super professional on the job. The captain savagely shuts him down and throws this classic burn his way. Clearly I wasn't talking to you, big <laughs> You cherub-looking mother <laughs> I was talking to your partner over here, fake-ass handsome McGee. There's nothing quite like getting insulted by a former NWA member playing a cop. Infiltrate the dealers, find a supplier. What if we find the supplier first? We don't have to worry about the dealer. God damn. Infiltrate the dealers, find a supplier. Number 18, your mom's chest hair, Mean Girls. Mean Girls taught us a lot of things, like how to properly catalog a burn book, or like the rules of feminism. Ex-boyfriends are just off limits to friends. I mean, that's just like the rules of feminism. But most importantly, it taught us how to expertly clap back at jerks, thanks to the pure genius of Janice Ian. The resident goth girl and former best friend of popular girl Regina George, Janice is frequently the target of errant abuse from random students. But that doesn't mean she can't deliver in the insult department herself. When one student throws a jab at her while she's having a conversation with Katie, she does not miss a beat throwing one right back. Nice wig, Janice. What's it made of? Your mom's chest hair. The ease with which she absolutely destroys this loser is something we can't help but admire. Number 17, take this quarter, Uncle Buck. You so much as scowl at my niece or any other kid in this school and I hear about it and I'm coming looking for you. In this classic 80s comedy, John Candy plays Buck, a man who's tasked with watching his nieces and nephew in the midst of a family emergency. As he adjusts to life as a temporary parental unit, he hits a few bumps in the road. But I know a good kid when I see one. Because they're all good kids. Until dried out, brain dead skags like you drag them down and convince them they're no good. When he's called into a meeting with the assistant principal at his youngest niece's school, their encounter seems doomed from the start, as Buck cannot stop referencing the mole on her chin. I'm, I'm the wart. She's my tumor. My, my growth. My, uh, my pimple. I'm Uncle Wart. Just old Buck Wart Russell. That's what they call me. After she calls his six-year-old niece a bad egg, Buck does not hold himself back in defending Maisie and makes a comment about the obvious growth protruding from the woman's face. Take this quarter. Go downtown and have a rat gnaw that thing off your face. The look of utter shock on her face is priceless and oh so satisfying. Number 16, Teeth on Fire, Encino Man. A teen movie just isn't a teen movie without a resident jerk, and this movie delivers. No, stop. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Why do you make me do this? While the story follows a recently defrosted caveman and his adventures in modern times, it also focuses on the woes of the teenage boy Dave who befriends him. Dave is painfully in love with Robin, but she's dating the school jerk Matt. Matt uses Dave's love for Robin as a constant source of ridicule, and his insults are enough to send even the happiest of kids into an instant depression. Some of us pump, and some of us slump. You should try some pump, Morgan. Might clear up your acne. So when he sees Dave talking to Robin, he doesn't hesitate to put him in his place. I know about your stupid Palm King bullshit. Forget it. Robin wouldn't piss on your gums if your teeth were on fire. Yeah, she would. Number 15, Michael Bolton, Office Space. It's gotta suck sharing a name with someone you loathe, and probably worse if that person happens to be famous. Michael Bolton? That's me. This 90s hit centers on a group of disgruntled employees and their desire for revenge on their employer. While the plot focuses mainly on the story of Peter, the emotionally numb protagonist, there's also Michael Bolton, who's got his own set of problems. With a thankless job that's on the line at a company he hates, being reminded that he also shares a name with a famous singer is enough to give him some major resentment issues. Yeah, well, at least your name isn't Michael Bolton. You know, there's nothing wrong with that name. There was nothing wrong with it until I was about 12 years old and that no-talent ass clown became famous and started winning Grammys. It also leads to some pretty hilarious insults. 
especially when he discusses the issue with a coworker. Why don't you just uh, go by Mike instead of Michael? No way. Why should I change? He's the one who sucks. Number 14. Get out of the road. The 40-year-old virgin. Sometimes when you've just chased your fleeing girlfriend across town and crashed through a moving billboard in the middle of traffic, you'd like a moment of privacy. I'm a virgin. I always have been. Oh, and is that what all this was about? Unfortunately for Steve Carell's character Andy, he's afforded no such courtesy. After he and his girlfriend get into an argument that sees her bolt from his house, Andy follows her on his bicycle and winds up flat on his back following a tumble through a two-sided sign on the back of a truck. He finally gains the courage to inform his girlfriend that all of their troubles have been connected to his virginity. Uh, oh, that's why I never tried to have sex with you. I was scared. And just when you think they're approaching a moment of intimate honesty, a random dude in a car hurls this unforgettable insult their way. Get the f out of the road, virgin! Shut up, you f jerk! No, that's okay. Oh, it's all right. Sorry. Number 13. Really thirsty. Con Air. Tu eres el mio, 23, si te conozco. When you're a convict who's done his time and is just trying to get back to his wife and a strange daughter, the last thing you want is to be caught up in some plane bound criminal shenanigans. Nick Cage's character Cameron Poe has boarded a plane with the intention of reuniting with his family after completing an eight year stint in the clink. But a few of the prisoners on board have other plans. Call me Johnny 600 if they knew the truth. Yeah, it doesn't have quite the same ring to it. Case in point is Cyrus the Virus, who doesn't appear particularly fond of one of the less savory prisoners and makes absolutely no pretense about it, describing him in the most unpleasant way possible. For me, you're somewhere between a cockroach and that white stuff that accumulates at the corner of your mouth when you're really thirsty. Hey, even criminals have to have standards. Number 12. The Epic Rent. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I like Frank Shirley, my boss, right here tonight. When you've spent the bulk of your professional life working for a boss you can't stand at a company that you can barely tolerate, you might get a little disgruntled at a less than stellar Christmas bonus, especially when you were planning on using it to put in a swimming pool. It's a, a one-year membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. <sighs> oh, God. And this exact situation was precisely enough to send Chevy Chase's character on an extended insult-filled tirade aimed at his less than generous employer in this holiday comedy. I don't want to tell him what a cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking. This rant seems to go on forever, and we love every second of it. Dog kissing, brainless, less, hopeless, heartless, fat ass, bug eyed, stiff legged, spotty lip, worm headed sack of monkey shit he is. But what's most important is that he got it all off his chest, and we got to laugh heartily at his unhappiness. Number 11. Bricks and Shelter. White Men Can't Jump. This top-class setup and perfect punchline really hit home. No matter how good their competition is on the court, no one stands a chance against Billy Hoyle's sharp tongue. A trash-talking master, Woody Harrelson is the bad cop to Wesley Snipes' good, and this public put-down is jail-worthy. Hey, I'm, I'm doing two things. What? What are you doing? I'm making them mad. Most guys don't play good when they're mad. Look, you know you're embarrassing me. That's what you're doing. Yeah, well, that's the other thing I'm doing. Trying to psych out the competition into making a mistake, Billy accuses his opponents of throwing up bricks and throws out a jab that hits way below the belt. Let's stop right now and let's just gather up all these bricks and let's build a shelter for the homeless so that maybe your mother has a place to live, all right? Word to the wise, if you really want to hit your opponent where it hurts, drag his mother and sister into it. I want your mother and your sister out of my house immediately. It is a priceless play and a savage slam dunk. It's also one of many classic Yo Mama jabs in this sports comedy. Now hold on, what were you talking about, mother? When your mother's so poor, I seen her kicking can down the street. I said, what you doing? She said, moving. Number 10, but that's in Ohio, Revenge of the Nerds. When the nerd faces off against the jerky jock, we gotta root for the underdog. And when it comes to their classic exchange, we're sure we pick the right side. When big man on campus Stan Gable rolls up and yells at him from his motorcycle, Dudley Booger Dawson casually delivers one of the greatest lines in insult history to no one in particular. What are you looking at, nerd? Huh? I thought I was looking at my mother's old bag, but that's in Ohio. He comes up with this quip so fast it gives us whiplash. It's just a shame Stan didn't get to hear it. Though maybe it's for the best because that surely would not have ended well for Booger. 
Number 9. Yes, it's true. Ghostbusters. This verbal low blow is heard loud and proud by the mayor of New York, no less. Okay, making the Environmental Protection Agency the bad guy in your movie is a bit of a hot take, but in Ghostbusters, that villain is personified by a classic smug 80s jerk. Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by here. After Ray gives an irate Walter Peck an unflattering nickname, Pete Venkman uses his dry wit to go straight for the jugular. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no what makes this line especially funny is how straight-faced Venkman is, knowing that the mayor was most definitely not asking about that part of Ray's comment. Nothing says screw you like mocking a guy's manhood, and it gets an appropriate response from Mr. Pecker. The uh, Peck, sorry. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, insulting its reproductive organs may be a good idea. All right, all right, all right. Well, that's what I heard. This city hall. Number eight. If my dog was as ugly as you, the Sandlot. Ah, the ugly joke. Will it ever get old? Not for us, and not for Ham Porter. As we learn from White Man Can't Jump, there is no better way to psych out an opponent than to hit him right in the ego. It helps that Porter's delivery is spot on as he lowers his voice and heightens the hilarity with this classic quip. If my dog was as ugly as you, I'd shave his butt and tell him to walk backwards. A dog can be ugly, its butt even more so. But if your face is worse than Fido's shorn derriere, you are doing something seriously wrong. Porter also goes for another tried and true tactic, bringing up your opponent's sister to great results. Hey, is that your sister out there in left field? Naked? She's naked. Shut up, Porter! Hey, hey, hey! Take note, batters, and take a look in the mirror, but don't compare anyone to a girl. Number 7. Motivational Insults – Dodgeball – A True Underdog Story An insult-spouting legend, Patches O'Houlihan strikes comic goal during his terrific team pep talks. The average Joes with their less-than-average performance are in need of motivation, so this dodgeball legend rolls in to help. Are you sure that this is completely necessary? Uh, necessary? Is it necessary for me to drink my own urine? Probably not. No, but I do it anyway. However, Patch's motivational style involves breaking his team down and then building them back up again, letting them know just how inadequate they really are. You couldn't hit water if you fell out of a boat. It also involves sending them out into oncoming traffic and throwing wrenches at them. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? Oh! Oh! Questionable as his techniques may be, they work. One of Patch's more memorable comments compares the team's running to what happens inside his shorts. Come on, I, get, I get better runs in my shorts! Hey, whatever works. Number 6. Cartman's Song – South Park – Bigger, Longer, and Uncut After Mrs. Broflovsky complains about the negative influence TV has on kids and wages war on Terrence and Phillip's home country of Canada, Eric Cartman has had enough. When he can't hold it in anymore, his rage bursts forth in the form of an unforgettable song and dance number that crosses lines of decency with every verse. I'm getting pretty sick of him calling my mom. Well, it's I'm so catchy, Cartman even gets some backup from his schoolyard chums. Come on, you all know the word. Cartman's stand is hilariously rude, a rise against parents and a teenage anthem. To top it all off, Kyle's mom arrives just in time to catch the end of the song. We can't imagine she loved it. What? Number 5. Chewed Bubblegum – Full Metal Jacket There's a ton of insults thrown every which way, but Private Pyle receives the brunt of the attention. This includes many jokes directed at his weight, which beat out other references to Private Cowboy's height. How tall are you, Private? Sir, 5 foot 9, sir! 5 foot 9, I didn't know they stacked that high! While almost all of Hartman's rants are R-rated, this one is especially soul-crushing, giving gum a whole new life. Your ass looks like about 150 pounds of chewed bubblegum piled. It's a little hard to laugh when you remember the story's tragic ending. But just looking at the jab itself, there's no denying Hartman has a brutal way with words. It's pretty amusing if you're not on the receiving end of it. Number 4. Questionable Living Arrangements – Parenthood Ah, young love. At one moment, it can burn as brightly as the sun. The next moment, it can turn sour. But rarely is that downward spiral expressed so eloquently and with such pizzazz as in this film. He told me he loved me. After Todd breaks Julie's heart, he bursts through the door to apologize and declare his love. I thought I'd find you here. <sighs> what does that make you, Sherlock Holmes? I live here. However, he is quickly sent packing with a ringing in his ears. 
Julie sums up her disdain for him in the harshest way possible. You live with me. I wouldn't live with you if the world were flooded with piss and you lived in a tree. Sharp and with sizzle, it is a very harsh prize put down. And the fact that it's said to Keanu Reeves is just the icing on the cake. Number 3. Smelly Pirate – Anchorman – The Legend of Ron Burgundy Ron is furious after Veronica reads the news while he's trapped in a glass case of emotion, and the two do not handle their mutual anger very well. They can't seem to be near each other without verbally sparring. When Veronica cuts in on Ron's TV time to watch a tape, the two engage in a war of words that has us crying with laughter. Mr. Burgundy, you are acting like a baby. I'm not a baby, I'm a man! I am an anchor man! You are not a man, you are a big fat joke! I'm a man who discovered the wheel and built the Eiffel Tower out of metal. Undeterred by the watching crowd, the anchor man confidently delivers his zingers with a steely eye and a stiff upper lip, mustachioed as it may be. I will have you know that I have more talent and more intelligence in my little finger than you do in your entire body, sir. You are a smelly pirate hooker. You look like a blueberry. Ms. Corningstone gets some comebacks in there, but we barely heard them. We were laughing too hard at the pirate thing. Unfortunately, Ron did, and let's just say he didn't take it too well. Well, you have bad hair. What did you say? I said, your hair looks stupid. No! Number 2. May God Have Mercy on Your Soul – Billy Madison Fresh off a speech that leaves the crowd cheering comes a judicial jibe that cuts deep. Billy, at his moment of triumph, is hit with a long and eloquent insult so hilariously hyperbolized, it leaves us as shell-shocked as Sandler's character. Mr. Madison, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. The combination of the harsh words and the ultra-cool delivery ensures that this sentiment shall not be forgotten. The added touch of may God have mercy on your soul really pushes this speech over the line, making it all the more comically harsh. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. The laughs don't stop there, though, as Billy's response makes us laugh even harder. Okay, a simple wrong would have done just fine, but the Way to cut a man down in his moment of glory. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. French Taunter – Monty Python and the Holy Grail What are you doing in England? Mind your own business! Monty Python's French Taunter has heckled his way to the top, and deservedly so. A warrior of words with a certain je ne sais quoi, he sits atop the castle wall and awaits a time when he's able to give passing English monarchs what for. Ah, blow my nose at you, so-called Arthur King! You and all your silly English niggas. But the cream of the crop when it comes to his verbal sparring? It's a taunt from the turrets that will stand the test of time. Every last word he says is endlessly quote-worthy. Is there someone else up there we could talk to? No, now go away or I shall taunt you a second time! Decades may have passed since this classic film came out, but we still have yet to hear a better insult than I fart in your gender direction! Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries! Did we forget your favorite insult? Let us know in the comments below. I'll wave my private parts at your aunties, you cheesy lot of secondhand electric donkey bottom biters! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.